Good morning. Happy Wednesday, y'all. I give folks a minute to get here. Um, y'all, it is so cold. <laughs> I know. We're not even in winter yet, and it's like it's not even in the 40s, right? But I am so cold. Um, it's been like a, a journey. For those who don't know, um, it, over the last couple of years, I've lost a significant amount of weight, which is wonderful. I mean, I would like to lose more, but who wouldn't, right? And um, I my like internal temperature gauge is just so off of what it used to be. Happy Wednesday. And so um, I know our house is like set to 70, but I like, it was so hard to get out of bed this morning because I was so frozen. <laughs> How pathetic, right? Okay. First world problems for sure. For sure. Good morning. Good morning. I see folks coming now. So we will get started. Let me, oh, there we are. Um, I am so excited to see um, some of y'all wrote yesterday um, how helpful this is. And I am finding this to be really, oh, thank you, John. Um, I'm finding this to be really helpful too um, in my own, my own personal life, my own faith with Christ. Um, I think this stuff is hard, and I think what you're going to find um, as we keep going is that some of these things we're going to we're going to actually like drill down on harder, and um, and you might be like, oh, I already talked about this, but you're going to find it it opens up something new too, right? We're talking about freedom, and freedom we know freedom is hard fought even in our own life, and um, so yeah, so today we're talking about hypocrisy, fun. Right. Um, I when I saw that picture, when I was looking for like a, a thing for our scripture today, and it was like, hi, my name is hypocrite. I'm like, oh gosh, right? It's so bold and um so true. And um here here's the thing, right? Um in the church world now, right, they talk about um there are different categories of people. There's there's a growing number of what they call nuns, people who have no connection. Um, to faith. Never have. We're not raised in the church. They don't have a church language. They don't have those, the, the Christian, they don't have Christianese, right? And um, so there's that category and that's growing all the time because culturally people aren't raising their children in church anymore. Um, and, and for lots of reasons. There's also this category called the Duns. And the Duns have also grown significantly over the last 20 years. And the Duns are people who um, maybe were raised in the church, um, maybe, uh, you know, maybe spent lots of years in the church, but they have been hurt by the church or people in the church and they've walked away and they, they maybe still claim a faith, right? They still practice, uh, Christianity, right? They still have a relationship with Jesus, but they are done with the church. And, um, I think we can attribute a lot of the duns to hypocrisy. And I don't mean that they are hypocrites. I mean that we are all hypocrites, therefore, right? And, um, right, it's one of the major reasons, right, hypocrisy, where someone acts different than what they say, is one of the major reasons people reject the gospel of grace. Because what they see in Christians doesn't reflect what the scripture says about Jesus. And, um, and I like, you know, I like this quote. I don't even, um, I wish that in her book, the, the person who wrote the thing, like she just footnotes it and so you have to look it up in the back. And I really wish it was not that way, but that's just my complaint because we're in week two and that's number 22. So this comes from Josh McDowell and Don Stewart, but, um, well, she does claim, she does quote them, but, um, she says this Christianity does not stand or fall on the way Christians have acted throughout history or are acting today. Christianity stands or falls on the person of Jesus. And Jesus was not a hypocrite. But since Christianity depends on Jesus, it is incorrect to try to invalidate Christian faith by pointing out horrible things that have done in the name of Christianity. Like that sounds all good, right? Um, yeah, I think I bet a lot of people have friends and family in that category um, that are just totally over what they've seen in the church. Um, hey, good morning, Patrice. Hey, Callie. Hey, Wanda. Hey, John. Okay. Um, 
so I, I mean, I think that's true. Like, I th just think that people have been hurt. And here's the thing, right? We can say that, that Christianity rises and falls on Christ. That is 100% true. But what people see is us, right? And not that we're not, we're going to stop being hypocrites. We're going to talk about this in a minute. But we do, like, we do have a responsibility, you know, for our witness, Right. As Christians, right, it's easy to point, um, as Christians, it is so easy to point at other people. We can be like, okay, well, those people hurt my son, right? Or those people hurt me. Um, and uh, therefore I'm done with them. I'm gonna walk away. And um, maybe we don't always walk away from the big church, but maybe we we go to a new church, right? Like that's uh we, you know, and I love this. Um, my current mentor, and um, he's a coach for our church right now, Clarence Brown, who's just He's just an amazing human being and pastor. But um, Clarence said to me recently, he said, the problem with folks who leave church is that when they like it's they have a really hard time finding a new church. And he said, the reason is because they get to the new church and there are people there, too. Right. And that's totally true, because um, we people, we are imperfect human beings and we don't get it right. And um, we get to a place where we think like people shouldn't act like this or people shouldn't treat each other this way. And um, and and that's the problem, right? Topography, as Barb defines it, is when our behavior doesn't match our belief. I mean, that's so um, when our, our behavior doesn't match our stated beliefs. You know, now here's the truth. We're all hypocrites, right? We know that lying is wrong, but we lie all the time. Right. We know that we're supposed to love our neighbor, but they cut us off, off in traffic and I don't want to act very loving. Right. Or um, like we're all human. We know that we should. I don't know. Like we should be kind with our words, but someone is unkind to us and we give it right back. Right. Like all these things happen all the time and it happens in our house. It happens in our internal life. Right. Like we because we're not perfect, because we are. I'm marred by sin, <laughs> we're going to be hypocrites. And right, and just because we're a hypocrite doesn't mean we're a phony. I love that. Um, Josh McDowell says that just because a person does not is not perfect does not mean they're a phony. Just because we don't line everything doesn't line up doesn't mean we're not seeking the truth. Right. Um, and I love this. And she taught this in a different one of her studies. Keep your eye on your own hula hoop. So often we um we get distracted by seeing what other people are doing and criticizing what other people are doing and having a problem with what other people are doing and um right and then we go to legalism which is right you need to follow the rules um we but we have all these personal blind spots and we it is so much easier to see what other people are doing wrong than it is to see what we're doing wrong and um and Jesus tells us that we really need to keep our eyes on our own hula hoop, right? Matthew chapter 7, part of the, the Sermon on the Mount. What does Jesus say? But don't worry about the speck in your other, in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own eye, right? He says, you hypocrites, first get rid of the log in your own eye, and then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye, right? We, um, like, we are to look at ourselves first, Okay. And when we've gotten it all right, then we can look at others. And the truth is we'll never get it all right. So we just got to keep working on us, right? Let the Holy Spirit work on us. So as we walk into this text with Galatians day today, we find that Paul and Cephas, who is Peter, right? Paul and Cephas um, are having this interaction. Okay. So Peter comes to Antioch and Paul says, I opposed him face to face because he stood condemned, right? What he's saying is Peter was behaving hypocritically, right? And his, he had a large circle of influence. He's Peter, right? He's the head of the church. He's the rock on which the church will be built, right? And so Paul says, I had to say something, right? And what does he do? He opposes him, which that's a really strong word. I, um, she explains this in the book that the word oppose, the Greek word is and this and this to me and this, uh, and this to me <laughs> sorry which means to take a complete stand against to stand face to face and um here's the thing right um one of the pieces of of um 
of this is that when we are, when we oppose someone, we should stand face to face with them. There's a very big difference between having like this conversation Paul has. Okay. And we're going to talk about like, this is not a condemning conversation. This is a teachable moment conversation. Paul comes to it with hopes that they will find mutual ground, right? We're talking, we're going to talk about unity the rest of the week. So like they are, Paul's going for this place where they can move forward together. We talked about this on Monday, right? They didn't have secret conversations. They had private conversations where they could work this out. And they came to the same place. Remember, they came to this place where Jews and Gentiles are in the same space. And they um, everyone receives salvation through faith, right? That's the baseline. Don't forget the context. So when we come to this place, he says, when you know, Peter comes to Antioch. I pose him face to face. Why? Because before certain men came from James, okay, Jews is what he's talking about. He was eating with Gentiles, meaning he was eating at the table with people who were outside the fold. When you ate with people in the ancient world, that meant acceptance. It meant approval. It meant that you understood yourself to be in the same plane with them. It also probably meant that Peter was eating non-kosher food, okay? He was eating with Gentiles. That's a big deal. That is, um, and that matches what they decided at the Jerusalem Council, that Gentiles didn't have to become Jews to be a part of the faith. Peter doesn't then have to follow all the laws in order for salvation, right? You hear that? So when, though, James comes and he comes with his Jewish buddies, okay, Peter starts to separate himself. Right? He's like, oh, never mind. I don't want to be seen with the Gentiles. You see this? Right? Peter has a large sphere of influence. Right? People would have been watching to see what Peter will do. And so when he pulls away from the Gentiles, imagine like the middle school lunchroom. One day, Peter's eating with the not cool kids, and everybody thinks the not cool kids are a little bit cooler. And then the next day, Peter's like, uh -uh, sorry, I'm not even going to look at you. Right? And so suddenly, the not cool kids feel even less cool, and all the cool kids are like, yeah, those people are awful. Right? And it creates this problem, not only in his witness and his ability to reach people for Christ, but he, he actually is publicly harming the gospel, right? This thing that they've agreed upon, that Gentiles and Jews are to sit at the same table of faith, he has suddenly just torn it apart. And I love this line, Barb says, legalism and hypocrisy are like dynamite in a match. They put them together and they will blow things apart. And that's what's happening here. Paul is saying, you are destroying the gospel of grace in this moment when you are being a hypocrite. When you are saying, right, you don't have to follow the, like, you don't need to follow the law in order to be a part of faith. And then you are still acting that way. You are destroying the gospel of grace. And, um, and so Paul opposes him publicly. Not in order to condemn him. You are no longer a part of the church. You are bad, right? Like, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, I want your actions to line up with the gospel. He says, when I saw that you were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, this is verse 14, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you are forcing the Gentiles to follow the Jewish custom? Look, right? You are saying this and doing this, but then you're doing this. It needs to line up. I love um, Bob Goff talks about this thing, right? Um, and I've used it a lot. So if you've heard it before, I'm sorry. But, um, you know, when 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 people make a movie, okay, you know that, that like black and white thing that has like, you know, scene one, take three, right? And, and they, before they start filming, what do they do? But they clap it up, right? Like they like drop the arm and it makes that noise. Okay. And um, I, you know, I never knew what that was for, but Bob Goff explained that when you are filming, right? We all know this when you watch Netflix, sometimes your internet gets off and the sound and the picture doesn't match. So what that does is it gives it a particular sound that then will help you line up the sound to the, to the, um, to the, the picture. Okay. And Bob talks about like, it syncs it up, right? It gets everything in line. You know where it needs to sync up. What Paul is saying to Peter right here is you need to sync it up. You need to sync your actions up with what you're doing because it matters. 
And um, in Acts actually gives us, in Acts chapter 10, we actually get a picture of how God, right, the Holy Spirit works for Paul's um, actions to line up. Okay. In Acts chapter 10, which I didn't, I don't, oh, I did assign it. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, good. I'm so glad. Um, oh, yeah. You can't show them the number one. Sorry. I'm like looking back at y'all stuff. <laughs> okay. So in Acts chapter 10, we have, Peter has this experience. So he has come to, um, this is where he's ready. He, is he in Antioch? I never remember. He's um, been invited to eat at, at Cornelius's house. Okay. And um, Cornelius has had a vision to invite Peter to come eat with him. And so he sends some men to Joppa about 30 miles away. And he asks Peter to come to his house. Right. And Cornelius, you know, does that. And Peter comes back. And so the next day the messengers come to Peter and Peter is up on the, um, up on the rooftop of where he's staying and he's praying and he's hungry, right? He's hangry. Okay. And he has this vision. Okay. Where, um, God drops this like blanket full of food in front of him, except that it's not kosher, right? There's all these four legged animals. There's things that he, um, the Jews just don't eat. And, um, and, and Peter objects, right? Like, so this is, so Peter says, surely not, Lord. I've never eaten anything, anything impure or unclean because God has invited him to eat the food on this thing. And God speaks to him a second time and he says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And this happened three times immediately. Now, I love that, that it happened three times, right? Because think about Peter's history, right? He denies Jesus three times. They eat on the beach and, Peter, and Jesus says, do you love me three times? Then feed my sheep, right? So so for Peter to have this interaction three times, like he knows this is God's voice. Do not consider what I have made pure as impure, right? Do not consider what I've made clean as unclean, right? There's this, it's this moment where Peter understands, right? That this gospel is really open to all people. And that these rules that he learned as a child that mattered so much in Christ, it's his faith in Christ that matters more. And what Christ has made clean, we can't like we can't undo, right? And so actually, Peter gets up and he goes to Cornelius's house, right? He arrives there and he shares only the gospel with him. If you go farther in Acts ten, he shares the gospel with him, and then as a result, this is in verse. Let me pull it up in verses forty four and forty five of this is Acts chapter ten. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on. All who heard the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Right. So here you have before Peter's witness to the Jews that they could exclude the Gentiles. And suddenly now God has poured out the Holy Spirit on all of these people, Jew and Gentile. And suddenly his witness matches up. It is his is synced it up, right? Is that the right word? Sunk, sunk it up, synced it up, right? And um, it's this beautiful moment. The Holy Spirit came on all, right? The power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the gospel had prompted Paul to say, hey, you are not lining up to what you believe, right? And it made a difference. It created this beautiful example of repentance in Peter. It is easy to call out other people's hypocrisy behind the door, right? But um, I think where we have to start, we have to start with our own. You know, we um, we have to start with sinking our life up to the gospel. Not as a do more, do better, but a Holy Spirit convict me of where I need to change. This connection, this walk with God daily that tells us, you know, that 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 starts to mold and make us into something different. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and we have to remember that people are watching, right? We have all these duns and nuns in our life. I hope you do, right? That are watching and they want to know, right? This person claims to believe in Christ. How is their life? How is their life changing? How is their life being molded into this Christ person they say is so important, right? They see the gospel lived out in us, not just in what we say, not just because we go to church, but in how we act and how we treat others and what we say about others and um, and the way that we uh, the way that we speak. Right. And um, 
people, I love this. People, this is something probably grandparents said, right? Who knows? It goes, people learn more from what is caught than what is taught. What you live is going to matter more to your kids and your grandkids and the nuns and the duns around you than what you say and what you teach, right? How you live. Um, so are there people, are there people you aren't eating with right now? Are there people you've decided are outside of the thing, right? And what are, what are the fears, right? What are the fears and the worries that are keeping you from living what God is asking of you? I love that. The spirit is poured out on the homeless and the underprivileged. The spirit is poured out on people of different cultures and ethnicities. The the spirit is pulled out, pour, is poured out on people who live differently than us. The spirit is poured out on those boomers ahead of me and those millennial. Well, I don't know the uh, the millennials I live with and the Gen Zs and the Gen. I don't even know like behind me, right? Like the spirit, the spirit is telling us to reach all these people, right? The spirit is available to all these people. And um, I, I, I just really appreciated this. I'm going to read you the last paragraph as we finish up. She says this, reject any voice in your head or in your heart or around you that is condemning or criticizing you for that is not God's voice, right? Peter does not condemn Paul. I mean, sorry, Paul does not condemn Peter, right? Paul walks with Peter. They stay in this together, right? None of us is perfect. We all make mistakes. However, the beauty of the gospel is that we can always lean into God's grace at any time. Just as you didn't have to clean yourself up before knowing God, so you don't have to clean yourself up before confessing to God that you've lived differently than your words have proclaimed. God's grace is unconditional and unending. You don't have to get this perfect, right? The gospel of grace covers even our own hypocrisy. Amen. Um, if you have a book, there's a great exercise, prayer exercise, examine exercise in here. Um, you kind of talk about like what that. So I just highly recommend you do that. Even if you don't have time for all the book, like go to page 61 and spend five minutes, right? Um, walking through that, um, you know, praying, search me, oh God, know my heart, right? Test me and see if there's any ancient thoughts, see if there's any offensive way in me. And, um, and kind of listen for what God, what God gives you, what, what bubbles up to the surface, um, is there a difference between what you're saying and what you're living, right? So um, I think this is so helpful. Um, maybe you had an aha moment. I hope so. I hope you'll share it. I hope you have a great Wednesday. Um, let us uh, conclude this time in prayer. Lord, we, um, Lord, search us and know us. Know our hearts. Test our anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in us and lead us in a way that is everlasting. Lord, we know that every day there are mismatches between the way we are living and what we believe. And Lord, we want our witness to be one of love and grace. We want our lives to line up with you. But Lord, we know that there is no way to make our to make it happen ourselves. So pour out your Holy Spirit on us. May your spirit um, start to mold us and make us into something new. And Lord, in the places where our witness is not one of love, Forgive us and heal us. And uh, send people like Paul into our life to walk with us and to teach us and to um, not condemn us, but to lead us in your direction. But lead us in your direction. This we ask in your son's holy name. Amen. Some of us, me, make a lot more mistakes than we should. I, right? But for God's grace, all of us make more mistakes than we should. Okay. But shoulds, shoulds go back into that legalism stuff. Um, so I love how you ended that. But for God's grace, but for God's grace, right? Um, you're welcome. Love you guys. I will see.